Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Alec Titterton. Uh, I'm the Content Development uh, Manager for Computer-Based Maths. Um, and I'm going to introduce Anthony Zupnik in a minute, who'll take over after I've introduced what we're going to do, just for a couple of minutes. Uh, my background is in education, and I was brought in to provide the pedagogical and education expertise for the project that we're doing in Estonia at the moment on computer-based maths. Uh, so without further ado, let's go on to the next slide, which is that one. Okay, before we look at what computer-based maths is, we need to understand what we at Wolfram understand as maths. And we understand it as a four-step process, as you can see on the screen. We, un we understand it as you define the question, you, trans you convert your maths question, which might be a little bit fluffy, and you narrow it down a little bit. A little bit like saying, for one of our modules, are girls better at maths? Well, the first step of that is to actually narrow down what the question actually is. What are you trying to decide? Maths is, are girls better at? How do you define the question in a narrow, easily translatable sense? So the second step, where you take your, your real-world statement in defining the question, and you take the abstraction into the mathematical model that you're going to use. In the third step, we're computing, which is the easy step with Mathematica, as we've seen. And then the fourth step, is converting the output of whatever you've done in your computation stage and interpreting it in back into the real world sense and critiquing it and evaluating whether it is a sensible answer. So that's what we perceive as being the computer-based maths approach to maths, the problem-solving process, the four steps. What we currently see in traditional curriculum around Europe and the States is the curriculum has the wrong emphasis. It has an emphasis on stage three which is not about computation, it's about learning how to do the hand calculation process. Over about 80% of the time, three quarters of the time at least, spent on learning long division, expanding brackets, simplifying thirds, simplifying other ex um, algebraic expressions. So what we want to do at computer-based maths is redress this balance and bring it back to the problem-solving process where all the steps are equal in importance. We want to use the computers wrong way, for the compute stage. And we want to use the students for the stages that they're good at, defining the question, translating and interpreting. And what we want to do is put this all together in a nice diagram where the students are iterating, they're deciding whether they need to go another loop around the helix that we've constructed before they get to a refined solution to the problem that they're attacking and trying to solve. If you're more interested more in this um, solution helix of maths, computer-based maths website is showing, we've got it on a big PDF that you can download from our computer-based maths website. Please have a look. Okay. So I'll just come to, before I hand over, what we're actually doing with the Estonians. We're piloting in 30 schools at the moment. We had the brief to write an innovative statistics and probability curriculum covering two different age groups to give support to teachers who may not have used Mathematica at all and may even have some issues of using Windows or Macs or PCs. We have to give them opportunities to do assessment and we had to provide the end result free functionality within CDF Player Pro. So with that as our basis, we've constructed a deployment mechanism which includes a collaboration framework. So this is where I hand over to Anthony who is our technical expert on this, who will tell you about all the tools that we used in our collaboration framework. And I'll speak to you at the end to show you actually in action. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Okay, so I want to talk about the technical side of this. What, what kind of challenges do we have when we develop a framework like this? Because this is a, this is a very complicated subject, I suppose, that you want to get right. So the first thing that uh, when it comes to development, really we want easy to create demonstrations. So we want teachers to be able to go out there, learn a bit of Mathematica, or even not even know that much really Mathematica at all, and be able to create some, some demonstrations very easily. Now Mathematica lends itself to be able to do this actually quite readily, but we want to make it even simpler. So when it comes to actually building questions, we, we don't want it to be too difficult so the teachers can do it very easily. This is something that I'll show you. We want to have a convenient build process. So basically, when you know, you're developing your, your, your notebook, uh, your lesson, uh, you want to be able to develop it um, very seamlessly, but then you want the build process to build a whole, um, a whole module of lessons or something like that, all to be very easily done. 
So we need it to be convenient, we need it to be easy, not to know, have too much um, uh, programming knowledge in there. We want teacher and student versions because teachers, we want to empower them with extra, extra features and maybe some extra notes or something like that so that they can, they can demonstrate their, uh, their lesson or something like that in their own mode. And then when uh, with additional features turned on where the students may not uh, want, ac well, you may not want students to have access to those features. An example of this would be as if you're collecting all the students' uh, students' answers on your uh, on on your on your well on the server, and then you want to be able to read them through. But you don't want students to be able to see all those answers. So this is another issue that you have. And having teacher and student versions can do this. And this leads on to teacher and student collaboration, so that basically students can talk uh, talk via a server to the teacher, and teachers can collect collate all the data. So this is really really nice. And this is what we want to do. And finally. Speed. All of this uh, hinges on speed. We want this to be fast, efficient in creation, build time, and execution. All of it. Because we don't want any process at, this, at any level to be an inconvenience to teachers. So what have we actually created? Uh, what can I show you? Um, so the first thing that we can, I can show you is the, is the palette. So I can go to the computer-based math palette. You may have seen palettes before, especially uh, long users of, uh, of Mathematica may use them for convenience. Uh, but this allows us to, uh, to have our basic structure where we, can, where we can see our lessons. So here we've got our lessons, and I can log in. So it gives me a login. I should have logged in before, I guess. But now I log in, ask me which child, class I want to join in, and because I've got, I'm in a lot of classes, well, okay, three classes, then it will, it will ask. So I can edit my account details. I don't really need to uh, show you that at this point. Um, I, can, I can add myself to classes or, de or delete from classes uh, myself, or I, I can, I, as a teacher, if I'm a teacher, can do the same thing for students. And one thing that is good is uh, privileges. So what we can see is if I open up this bar, uh, I've got a bunch of uh, I've got a bunch of different um, uh, different options here, buttons which wouldn't be available to a student. So a student's bar uh, palette will look very similar to this, uh, but they won't be able to invite people to classes, delete people from classes, check attendance. So I can check attendance, and I can see who's actually uh, part of this class at the moment. And there are a bunch of uh, fictional users that I created for this uh, for this demonstration. As you can see, they're in, and there are a bunch of other people who are who are not in this lesson. So this empowers the teachers or administrators to be able to create classes and grant privileges themselves if they're an admin. So all of this needs is all of this data is stored uh, on a server on a uh, on a collaboration server, uh, which uh, the data is stored using uh, using uh, MySQL, and um, the the processing of the information we use Web Mathematica for this. So how do we call the server? Well, we have a function which exists, a uh, cool CBM server, uh, which allows us to do a multitude number of things. So here I've got uh, a command which replace, which replaces the, uh, whatever the information is um, for an activity. So here I've got an activity called EWTC test. And I'll say, I just want to add hello world to the server, essentially, uh, with, this, uh, with this activity ID. So I get a message saying success, and obviously, if when you're when you're when you're make, developing interactive materials, this is kind of like back-end stuff which you'd hide from the user. Uh, but here, I can just show you how easy it is to do something like this. I can retrieve the information that I just uh, that I just sent uh, by using the same thing, but with get. Oops, I don't want to do that. And then you can see it returned hello world because what I sent was hello world in the first place. And then I can even use a record get if I need some more information specifically. So this is a bit more of an expensive, um, uh, an expensive uh, uh, call because you're sending more information. And okay, in the grand scheme of things, this doesn't seem uh, like a lot. But then if you're uh, you're collecting, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of uh, students' data or something like that, then this could end up being more expensive. But here it gives me some information about the date that I answered the question, which was a minute ago, uh, who it was, what my username is. Um, et cetera, et cetera. I can append to, uh, to my results. So here in EWTC test again, I'm going to append a, an expression. So this is the really good thing, is that we can send expressions across. So here I'm sending a plot across, two plots in fact, one sine x and one cosine 5x. And then I can use get again as before, and I can get uh, what I just sent to the server 
which is uh, the hello world from before, my plot and my two plots. So this can be really good, really useful to be able to do this. And uh, just to show you like, what it looks like if you have multiple students' worth of data, because we're looking at just a single student's worth of data, I made some fictional random data. I'll record get with uh, and find out with the EWTC 2014 activity what answers were given. And we can see that these uh, 1 to 10 EWTC 2014 is great. Um, uh, have, have sent these random numbers across and you can see it a bit more easily if I do a get and it just, I just did some random integers that I sent across the server. So this collaboration server is, you know, is extremely important. You can't live without this really if you want to be able to develop um, uh, meaningful interactive content, I think. So translations uh, is another thing that's important because we're dealing with a lot of uh, different countries uh, and one of the countries which we have uh, fully translated is uh, Estonia right now. So I can, uh, as a command, set CBM language to Estonia, Estonian and I can see it's coming up in Estonian right here, which is great. And then if I wanted to switch back, which I will do because I don't understand Estonian, um, I, can have it, I can have it back in English. So. Now that I've talked to you about the collaboration framework, we have a question framework which uses the collaboration framework as, its, uh, um, uh, as, an, underpinning, as an underpinning thing. So to use all this uh, cool CBM uh, server stuff and create a question framework is what we've done. So we have uh, currently 16 question types in total. And uh, I want to show you a few of them that exist. So I can create, uh, we have this, uh, this expression question and we've got a few, uh, a few little bits of information here. So we've got the title, write a little bit about yourself. A question type is a string because we're going to be using a string. We want to be able to send this over to the server and we give it an, ident an ID and then we just run it. So now it says write a little bit about yourself and I'll say I am 26 years old. I will send it. It's confirmed that it's sent. It says resend, so I know that it is sent now. And now if I call my CBM server, I get my information out that I just, uh, that I just sent. So uh, we're not limited to this. So here we can send number questions, uh, for example, and then give a specific answer that uh, is required. So here I'm saying, what is 2 plus 2? And I'm saying that 4 is the, is the only answer that will be true. So if I run 5 right now, we can see that it's highlighted in red. I'll give myself another go because I didn't put any limitations like that. And I'll try again. And uh, 4 is correct. Uh, and that's all worked quite nicely. And then I can even use a... Uh, oh, no, that's incorrect. Well, that's not important. Uh, I've sent this answer over to the server. So I could limit the number of uh, times that someone could send this, uh, this, this answer over. But here, I've given them as many tries as they like to do it. So another one, checkbox, what is your favorite number, I'm going to ask. And they say they have to basically one, if they answer one, it's true, two false, three true. Uh, and uh, I don't think I'm going, to, oh, I'm going to send this to the server as well. I didn't really need to do it. Um, but now if I go for the number two, I send the result. It tells me that I'm, uh, that I'm, I'm wrong. My favorite number is wrong, um, if that could be such a thing. And uh, obviously, if I pick, uh, pick one of the ones that I labeled as true, I can do that as well. Multi-question panel allows you to put multiple questions in one thing so it doesn't clutter up your, uh, uh, your notebook or something like that. So here, I've, I've inputted uh, all the questions that I did previously. Well, actually, I entered a few more, um, where now I can, uh, where I can basically put a quiz in. So here, I've got, what is your favorite number? I got that correct. Did I have breakfast today? No and uh, enter the value of x, uh, where x squared plus 5x plus 2 equals 0, and I don't remember that now. Well, well I, I, won't, I won't do I'll just put, I'll put 4. It's not going to work. And now I just go uh, next, and then I'll check my answers, and it will tell me, uh, it will give me a, an answer, and I could have sent this, to my, sent this to the server as well, but here, okay, we know that I got that, the first one correct, wrong, wrong. Uh, and it's given me a score as well. A drag and drop. If you were in my last talk, I used some, uh, uh, some flags. And um, 
I decided that I would use them in this talk as well. So this, we're, we're, we're not answering any, well, we haven't put a specific question in mind, but we're just going to match the, the flags to the, uh, to the countries. So I'll go Cyprus, Hungary, the UK, Germany. Okay, I, I, <laughs> I know it's the wrong way around. Um, but just to, uh, just to show you, I'll check my answer, and you can see the, the two correct ones have gone have gone green, and two incorrect ones have gone red, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll switch it around and then it's fine. Um, and finally, for the questions at least, uh, freeform line, which I thought was pretty cool, we'll have this graph, your money versus happiness. So let's have a think. My personal opinion on this is, well, millions, so once I get to a million, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm going to be pretty happy there. Okay. So now I can send this to a server, and this is again another expression that I can, that I can send across, so I'm just going to get this information that I sent and just show a graphic, and this is just what I, what I drew, which I, which I can get across, and this is something that uh, is, is really interesting, that you can, that you can play around with. You're, you're not limited by, what, we can, uh, by what, what is there. You can make your own uh, application of this, uh, which is really interesting. So finally, which is not something that uh, I have time to talk about, unfortunately, is our authoring tools. So I mentioned, um, I mentioned how you, we want teachers uh, to be able to build their own, uh, be, build their own lessons very easily. Um, we have uh, modules, lessons, and activities which all build up in a nice, in a nice cell structure, which um, uh, efficiently allows you to section off your, uh, your lessons, basically. Uh, and then within the author tools, you are allowed uh, teacher and well, you, you create one notebook, and then when you process that notebook, which is just at a touch of a button, basically, uh, student and teacher versions are made simultaneously. So you don't have to worry about building a teacher and then a student version specifically and cut pieces out. So this is really nice. And then we have uh, automatic indexing and palette creation uh, on top of that as well, which is nice. So other than that, now we'll uh, go back to Alec, and I've just got a so sign, sign, sign into a different server. Uh, <laughs> Oops. Oops, sorry. Okay, there you go. Thanks, Anthony. Just. Uh has gone dead. Okay. Okay. Uh, last five minutes. I'm going to take you through what this looks like in practice to a teacher. Um, Anthony's showing you the question framework, showing you the code. Obviously, you need to see the results of the feedback you get from the students. So let's have a little look what that looks like in practice to a teacher. I'm going to show you a module called Can I Spot a Cheat? And you're seeing the teacher version here, or you may be if you're nearer the front. Um, what we've got here is a summary of the module. This is the narrative leading us through the story of the problem-solving process. Going from the beginning where we're defining the question at the outset in lesson one, looking at how you spot fake data, what's, the, what's, what's actually mathematical about data that you can spot being a fraud, and what we're going to do in this lesson is introduce um, a coin flip 200 times and see what the effect of having a fraudulent result being written down compared to the effect of having a real coin flip result being down. It goes into a hypothesis test, how students perform that and how easy it is to do with Mathematica. And then the last two lessons are little project-based um, lessons where the students are a little bit more, allowed a bit more open-endedness and off they go and they can use their skills they've learned in the first two lessons to solve other problems to do with other fraud. Okay, so as a teacher, I've looked through the narrative, I can see where I'm going. Um, what we've done is got a facility where we can instantly create a printout, which in this window is very small. And this mouse isn't behaving very well. And that's not worked properly. Go, your mouse is just, it's probably there. Yeah. Um, we've also got teacher preparation mode where they can edit the questions and insert their own. So what we aim to do is then to have a lesson printout running down by the side that they can see where they're going, and then begin the lesson. Oh, I'm just going to use the tracker pad. And then we go into lesson one. So lesson one looks a little bit messy to me at the moment because I've got lots of blue strips going across the screen. Well, that's all the information for the teacher. 
as I said, the Estonians wanted us to give total guidance to the teacher. They wanted us to write down the steps that were involved in each modality. We call a modality a way of interaction between teachers and students, or students and students. So this is a modality called estimator value. We've got the steps written down and described. If the teacher doesn't know anything about it, we've even got what to say, so we've got a little script. We've got a technical manual in case there's something there, and there's, this one's greyed out because there are no answers, um, and that all disappears. So then we've got the text that the student will see. So what we've got here is the button, the teacher can just check what the student will see. So you can see most of it disappears. It's nice and clear and crisp for the students. And they have to decide, well, if, I, if I'm flipping a coin 200 times, students then have to think about, well, how, how many heads might I get? Well, I, if I got 150 heads, would I accept that as still being in the realms of possibility, or is that a bit too weird for me? And each student then can set their limits of how weird the results, the number of heads you get from 200 might be. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to set mine at 133 down to um, 67. I'd still accept that as being possible within the realms of possibility for a head coming up out of 200. And I've sent that, and there we get the result success. So this is using the uh, collaboration framework. This is a custom one. And then if I go back to the teacher, and I should close that, then in the teacher mode, then I can get all my student data through by pressing the refresh student data button. And this is what the data in this custom manipulate looks like. And what I can do is select that cell, and we've got the facility to throw it up to full screen. And then we can blast that out in front of the students. Now, this is also designed for extended display. So I could be working over on this display and have a little look about what I've got to say but I'm going to keep it in front of you because I'm on duplicate display. So these are the responses from the fictitious students in my class. I've got lower responses for their lowest ones and upper responses for their upper ones. And we can define then how weird the results would be on average. Well, we've got a box and whisker plot. Uh, the medians are 85. So this class would accept 85 up to about 115 heads as being realistic. And then the teacher can use the theoretical distribution and have a little look at how significant those results that the class has defined are compared to the theoretical distribution. So if I set those to the median values of the box and whisker, I'm looking at about 98% confidence that I'm going to be in the blue region for my 100 coin flips, sorry, 200 coin flips. So that's one functionality we think is great, having something you can throw up in front of the class to promote discussion. Okay. Um, and then going to go on to, I'm going to skip down a bit because I haven't got long. Skip on to activity five, if I can hit the button properly. So at the end of the lesson, we're looking at how tests might work for detecting whether coin results are fraudulent or not. So if I can flip to a text editor, I've got rather a lot of heads and tails results here. And I'm going to paste them in. So type in them. So there's 185 results. I'm just going to be fraudulent and make up some more till I get to 200. So there are 200 um, coin toss results. And what we've done is automate the process and given the students results about whether the computer thinks they are fraudulent or they are not fraudulent. So what we can show is the distribution of partitions. And if we want to go further into this, the teacher will show them what they mean by partitions. And as you can see, tests two, three, four, and five as the run length have failed, but I've managed to pass test one. So this is all based around hypothesis testing. And the rest of the next lesson goes into hypothesis testing. I'm going to skip a few just to show you what I mean. And skip to activity three. More, wakey, wakey. OK. So we, leave them in, we talk about partitions and how, what that means and so we can demonstrated exactly what partitioning of data means. Tally them up using tuples. Talk more about the theoretical distribution again. And then ask them about hypothesis test results, whether they're going to be accepting or rejecting hypotheses by giving them this little demonstration that shows confidence intervals and whether p-values are above or below what we would accept. So very quickly, just to finish, we can run simulations, get p-values out, at uh, 95%, I'm going to, I'll probably accept that one. This one, I would say, is okay as well. It's within the boundaries of acceptability, and that one. Uh, this one, that's a very small p-value, and you can see that 0, 0 as occurrence was 
useless, so I'm going to reject that one. And this one, okay, I've got, I'm going to reject that one as well. So that's the use of a simulation. I send in my results. And then what we can do is get all the results back from the server and look at who made the correct decisions, who made false, wrong decisions, and talk about type 1 and type 2 errors. The last thing I'm going to show you is how the students then, at the end of lesson 2, investigate fraud in terms of English football referees. And we've imported all the 2012-2013 Premier League data and asked the students then to look at hypothesis testing. And it was those three, wasn't it? So that one p-value is 0.18, so I would say for home fouls and away fouls, I would say that the referees are pretty fair. It's not significantly out of the 95% range. But if we look at the teacher material, then we can also look at um, yellow cards down here. It's in a blue box, so the students don't get to see it. So if we evaluate that one, then for yellow cards, we get a tiny p-value. So we would probably say that referees aren't being fair to home teams and away teams on yellow cards. And then the students would go off and investigate further and come up with their, their report, which they have to report to the rest of the students. I'm here for the rest of the day, and I'm also here tomorrow morning. I'm out on the stand out there. If you want to see more of the materials and a bit more in-depth and see how we've built up the other modules, I've got lots of time to talk to you. I'll be there. Please come and have a word.